1950, my book, British Broadcasting, A Study in Monopoly, was published. In it, I explained how it was that broadcasting became a public monopoly, and I questioned the reasons advanced to justify it. I visited the United States in 1948 to find out how a commercial broadcasting system operated. Then, in 1951, I migrated to, to the United States and started a research project, project that I called the political economy of broadcasting, based on experience in Britain, the United States, and Canada. The study was never completed, but I wrote a paper, the Federal Communications Commission, which in a curious way was to lead to the modern subject of law and economics. However, and this will interest the, you as students, this only came about because of a student note in the University of Chicago Law Review. The, this student note, therefore, played a crucial part in the events leading to the emergence of law and economics as a separate subject. It is sometimes said that I originated the idea of using prices to determine use of the radio frequency spectrum. This is wrong. The idea was first put forward by Leo Herzl, a student at the University of Chicago Law School, in a student note in the Law Review in 1950. It, the, the article dealt with the choice by the FCC of, of uh, the color, uh, color television system to be used there. This is what Herzl said. A much more controversial alternative would be to abandon regulation by government fiat altogether and to substitute the market. The FCC would lease channels for a stated period to the highest bidder. I read this article, but at first I was not convinced. There was, after all, the problem of defining the property rights and making sure that these rights were respected. But then there appeared a reply to Leo Herzl's article by Dallas Smythe, who had been the chief economist of the FCC. His arguments were so weak that I concluded that Leo Herzl was right. <laughs> and I adopted his proposal when I wrote my article on the Federal Communications Commission. But where did Leo Herzl get his idea from? It came from Abba Lerner's book, The Economics of Control, that Leo Herzl read in 1944 or 1945. Abba Lerner was, of course, one of the group of students at the London School of Economics from whom I learned my economics. And in the preface to, the, to his book, he acknowledges the influence, among others, of Arnold Plant. However, Abba Lerner was, was a socialist who thought that a socialist system could be run in such a way as to reproduce the optimum results as described in economic theory. In the main, by imitating the market, but not always. I remember that he went to Mexico to persuade Trotsky that all would be well in a communist state if, among other things, prices were set equal to marginal costs. <laughs> Convinced that the use of the radio frequency spectrum could be determined by the price mechanism in the same way as other goods and services, I wrote an article on the Federal Communications Commission in 1958 and 59 while at the Center for Advanced Study of the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. In the case of radio, the signal of one station uh, uh, interferes with and worsens the reception of others. And this uh, was a real problem and led me to examine the usual approach of economists at that time to this kind of problem. I uh, then studied the work of the English economist Pigou, and he spoke of the difference between private and social products 
and he wished to restrain the activity of those harming others. He proposed doing this by means of taxes, but the same result could be achieved in other ways. I objected to the Pigovian approach. We were dealing with a reciprocal problem. Suppression of the harm that one producer creates inv invariably inflicts harm on that producer. The, the problem is to stop the greater harm. I illustrated the nature of the problem by examining the English legal case of Sturgis against Bridgman. In this case, the working of a confectioner's machinery disturbed a doctor who occupied neighboring premises. The doctor sued and won his case. I pointed out that although the machinery no doubt caused harm to the doctor, restraining, restricting the methods of production that could be employed by the confectioner harmed the confectioner. I illustrated the situation with some hypothetical figures. I said that the doctor would be willing to waive his right if the confectioner would compensate him for the additional costs he would incur in carrying out his consulting elsewhere. I assume this to be $200. The confectioner would pay the doctor up to the additional cost imposed on him by the change in his methods of production which I assume to be a hundred dollars. With these figures, the doctor would not accept less than two hundred dollars and the confectioner would not pay more than a hundred dollars for the doctor to waive his right. It wouldn't happen. But consider the position if the confectioner had won the case, as well he might. The confectioner would be willing to waive his right for a payment greater than a hundred dollars the doctor would be willing to pay up to $200 to induce the confectioner to do this. The result is that the confectioner would waive his right. What this showed was that the legal decision did not affect the way the resources were used. As I put it, the delimitation of rights is an essential prelude to market transactions, but the ultimate result, which maximizes the value of production, is independent of the legal decision. While I was writing the FCC paper, Abba Lerner visited the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. He inquired what I was doing. I told him about my argument that the way in which resources were used was independent of the legal decision on ownership. He got the point in about a minute and agreed with it. Uh, David Laidler is, says in his article on, on Abba Lerner in the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences that uh, Abba was impressed by my argument and applied it in areas in which he was interested. That Lerner and I so easily agreed was understandable. It was due to what James B Buchanan in his book Cost and Choice calls the London tradition, a view of the concept of opportunity cost based on Wicksteed's common sense of political. It was a, a book that Lionel Robbins recommended that we all read, and I think most of us did. Buchanan quoted a pas passage from an article of mine that appeared in 1938 as giving a particularly clear statement of the LSE position. Now I'll read it to you. The cost of doing anything consists of the receipts that could have been obtained if that particular decision had not been taken. When someone says that a particular course of action is not worth the cost, this merely means that he prefers some other course. The receipts of the individual, whether monetary or non-monetary, doesn't matter, will be greater if he does not do it. This particular concept of cost would seem to be the only one which is of, of use in, in the solution of business problems since it concentrates attention on the alternative costs of action which are open to the businessman.